Oh, I see you got Michael Jordan here with us. Um, excited to have Michael on here so you guys can nerd out because I don't know as much about mead as you guys do. You guys are the experts. So uh, that's awesome to have you here. Mike, I see your mic. Michael, I see your microphone is muted. Um, so I don't know if we'll be able to hear you. Um, all right, guys. So I'm going to go ahead and start the poll now. So you guys can just uh, take a look at that poll and uh, answer the questions. And then while you're doing that, or as you finish that, please uh, start filling up that Q&A. We wanna get your uh, questions and uh, we'll let uh, Mike and Frank start talking as well. So you can ask even more questions and, uh, and I'm sure more questions will come up as the Q&A goes on. Feel free to uh, add more questions as we go. So I'm gonna launch the poll. Go ahead and start filling that, that out. <clears throat> And uh, in the meantime, we'll just let Mike get set up. And I can get into um, some of the questions that have already been typed in, Joe. Okay, uh, let's hold off on the questions just for a minute here. Let's uh, let them fill out the poll here real quick. Cool. And, and then we'll jump into it. Great. Um, just uh, as we're going or to start kind of kick off and fill up some time now while uh, the poll's being answered and questions are coming in. Uh, could you kind of run us through like your daily, weekly, monthly, seasonal kind of activities that you do uh, at, at Golden Coast Mead? Just to give, an, uh, give people an idea of like, if they're gonna start a mead company, what do they need to be doing on, the, on, a, on a daily kind of basis and seasonal, daily to seasonal? Well, so that's a little um, loaded. Like that assumes that folks want to do a full-time production metery, uh, or rather, I can speak at the full-time production metery. And um, Grant Schultz. Grant Schultz. When Grant Schultz was out here, he was like, "You're telling me I could just buy one of these tanks, make 300 gallons of mead, and sell $10,000 worth of mead with it? I I should do that." You know. Um, so, like in terms of function stacking. I think that's a really low resource, low infrastructure way to add an element to a permaculture farm. Um, it doesn't require that much specialization. You've probably got the customer there already. You're probably already selling them some stuff. They probably want some alcohol. If, they, if you've got good tasting alcohol with a great story, they're probably gonna buy one bottle of it for 20 bucks. You know, So 300 gallons is enough to make $10,000. And that operation is one honey harvest. You need 55 gallons of honey uh, for a 300 gallon batch. Um, so one honey harvest, um, typically you're lucky if your hives give you one to three gallons. So you need something between 55 and 20 uh, beehives. Um, and Michael can speak to that a little bit better um, from his experience. Well, I think that, can, can you hear me? My mic's on, can you hear yeah. me now? Yeah, yeah uh, an average beehive yields you about 25 to 30 pounds of honey. If you're getting more than that, uh, you must have less hives. That's about balancing and equaling your hives. But we try to go for uh, out of 175 hives, we try to produce each one to produce roughly 30 pounds of honey. Uh, most of our honey is a little bit sweeter than most and then back flavored down because we're using about anywhere from three to three and a half pounds of honey per gallon of water. So you're looking at, if we have 30 pounds, you're only looking at about 10 gallons, right? So for, per hive. Yeah, for, yeah. for hive equivalency, right, of what, what, we, what we're trying to produce. So it, it, it depends on how many hives you are, the location, uh, what types of honey you're using for flow. Some honeys, uh, I mean, you, you guys get all kinds of different kinds of honey. Uh, I mean, I've been shipping honey in and, so, you know, when you get clover honeys, apple honeys, uh, their, their uh, sugar content is over 84%, I believe is what it is. And if you get more of your wildflowers or you adjust down to, uh, uh, what's it, like sour wood and stuff like that, you're only hitting around 78 to 82% of sugar content in your honey. So some of those variable about the sugar content also with the honey and your flows. So... Uh, the one thing that I found out of making uh, mead is that 
every year you are going to have uh, different uh, flows of nectar that uh, this year clover might be super badass, man. And then you're not going to have a wet season and your clover flow is going to be lower. So you're not going to get the, some of the flavors, the amounts, or even the colorations, depending on even seasons. I, I don't know if you, have you seen that Frank? Oh yeah. Yeah. Variability in honey is huge, but you know, when, when we're tasting honeys prior to making a batch. So I think Michael is speaking as an expert and, and I think our audience has an opportunity to just like get their feet wet. So for some basic business modeling, there's a lot of layers of complexity that you could work into your model, but the likelihood that that's going to prevent action and, and get you on the road. So you start to learn is I think high. Um, so, so I think the rule of thumb that Michael confirmed was like a hive of healthy bees producing between 20 and 30 pounds a year is not unreasonable. And we like to think that one, and it varies a little bit based off of sugar density of the honey, but 12 pounds per gallon is our rule of thumb. Um, and we use one to four honey to water. So to make five gallons of mead, you need one gallon of honey. Uh, to make 300 gallons of mead, you need 60 gallons. Yeah, 60 gallons. Of honey. So that's like one drum. And that means that you're roughly 30 beehives. So if you could stack 30 beehives on your property, uh, turn it into, um, let's see, so that's roughly a thousand liters, uh, say a 500 milliliter bottle, which is what we use, gets you 2,000 bottles. And then you're charging 20 bucks for a bottle of 500 milliliter varietal mead just for your farm. And you're losing probably 20% during the process. So that's 2,000 bottles minus 20% is like 1,600 bottles times $20 is like $32,000 for like keeping your bees and making one batch of meat a year. Uh, that assumes you can sell every bottle of it and that it's great. Um, but I think if you follow the process that we laid out, the likelihood you're going to make a marketable meat is much higher than it was three years ago before the whole staggering nutrient addition and aeration thing was understood. So, so yeah, if folks are excited about the opportunity to make an extra 32K, you know, maybe it merits further uh, research and getting into the weeds like Michael was talking about, like where different honey flows have different sugar densities and flavor profiles are kind of weird. But what we do to overcome that is just call it, this is a specialty batch from this apiary. And it is a reflection of this year in this place, like the wineries do with vintages, you know? Yeah, it's Merlot every year. But this year it was different from last year. And so you call it a vintage and you pour some samples for people and you get them excited about how they can taste the sage in one year and they can taste the clover in the other year. And uh, then they want to give you $40, one for, you know, buy two bucks. So that's, that's kind of a premise that we, we hope works for folks in this community. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I totally believe that. I belong to, you know, I traveled to the Miser Cup. We traveled to... Uh, got mead and basically I don't really enter a lot of events but I like to go to the hotel rooms afterwards and do the swap and exchange right where the guy's going this is a seven-year-old or this is 15-year-old bottle what do you got to exchange and you guys all sample and taste and then the next thing you're walking out with you brought a case and you leave with the case but I've got some you know fig that's like 10 years old man and it's sitting around and it's aged well and you're only going to get it from that guy it's not like you're going to go buy it off a shelf some of these guys have uh, some meads that are super good josiah went with us to uh hunter's mood meadery in colorado and the guy made an earl gray tea one right that he only makes so much of it and that's a good little barter and exchange amongst i think great mead makers and that maybe if you do have 20 extra cases of a good 10 year old mead that's been really superior man you're going to get 120 dollars a bottle some of these uh, guys that have been collecting wines in their wine cellar they're paying big money to collect stuff for their wine cellars and i have people hit me up all the time for my apple brag if, if it's been over five years that they really want that to see if it still carbonates and pushes out and you know to get a couple bottles so i'm with you i think the aging of me and the holding off on it sometimes brings a higher value on some good product brother 
Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's a lot of opportunity and, and, you know, it gets me so excited to think about different people approaching it different ways and just blowing open this category and grounded in this desire to regenerate agriculture and, and help the bees with it and beekeepers. So, so it's exciting to share and uh, love to knock out each one of these questions, if that's cool, Joe. Yeah. All right. Let me, uh, let's jump in here. Uh, first, uh, before we begin, Mike uh, is, is kind of uh, joining us, just jumped in and we <laughs> really appreciate him being here. Mike, for those that don't know who you are, could you just quickly introduce yourself before we uh, jump into the questions? Sure. My name is Michael Jordan. I'm out of Cheyenne, Wyoming. I have a apiary of, of 175 beehives that we run and it's mostly just to make mead. Uh, I'm an expert council member with Jack Spearco and his survival podcast, and I teach beekeeping. And basically I'm on here because I wanted to talk to Frank because I want to do a collaboration with him one time and, uh, throw around some stuff and, and bring stuff that, uh, our BPT stamp should be here around May of next year from the feds. It takes around six months. And, uh, I've been brewing mead for over 26 years from a family recipe that's over 482 years old from Ireland. And uh, I love mead, man. <laughs> Mead's my thing. As Joe Sias know, we, we, we make tons of mead at my place and I travel around to go to meaderies and I enjoy mead so much. And it's delicious. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you ever get a chance, uh, I don't know if you, if you guys were at, uh, what was it, PV2? Uh, Mike started passing out some mead, but the king's mead. That's my favorite. But um, all right. <laughs> how this stuff was made. It's crazy. Like with the wax cap and the uh, no inoculated yeast, just the, the lactobacillus from the hive and like all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, I, lots of pollen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so um, just to make sure we're not jumping over each other, uh, the questions I'm going to direct towards Frank, and then um, after Frank's done answering, Mike can jump in, or if Frank wants, he can just call on Mike uh, to help answer any of the questions. So we'll go ahead and start up the question and answers. If you're just joining us for the question and answer session, uh, that means you might have missed the presentation. And if you'd like to see the presentation, you can see that. Uh, just head over to permethos.com. And uh, you can find your way to the to the on demand section where you can uh, get a chance to watch the full presentation. This is the Q and A session from that presentation, and where we'll just be answering questions from the live audience. <clears throat> so we'll start with the first question. First question comes from Jake. He says, "What's involved from taking a hobby of mead making to an actual commercial meadery?" Uh, entity structure, getting legal in your state, et cetera, et cetera. So that's huge. That's, um, that's the crux of it, right? That, and, and each state's a little different, um, but the big pieces are production. Can you make a mean that people want to buy from you um, at a margin that keeps you motivated to keep doing it, right? Can you make more money than you spend on it? There's a thing called... Uh, um, all right, gonna skip that part and it'll come back to me. Uh, the next piece, selling. Do you have a market near enough to you that's gonna consume all the mead that you can make or can you access that market online somehow like Amazon Wine sells mead and there's a meadery in Montana that does like I think 80% of their sales through online shipment through Amazon. Um, so can you make it, can you sell it? Are you licensed to do it? Because you know, looking at your wine. In mitigation, <laughs> That's the number one thing right there, brother. They can no, yeah. not selling liquor. <laughs> Federal agents knocking on your door is uh, is not a good day. Um, you know, you're you're able to make like I think it's sixty gallons a year for personal consumption per adult in your household. Um, but if they find out that you're selling it, and um, you know someone wants to bust you, then you can really get busted. So it's recommended, they want to tax, you know, there, there's a lot of taxation involved in the production of alcohol, but it's not that complex. For a small producer, there's a lot of, um, not leniency, but there's a lot less cost with complying with the federal and state regulations. So it's doable. 
Um, I was able to do it myself. I didn't hire any lawyers to get our federal and state permits. Um, it took a lot of deliberate uh, conversations with the regulators and like just getting on the phone is hard because their phone systems are like these archaic things that you just get rerouted and then the phone answers and then it hangs up automatically. And that was like 20 minutes of waiting on hold. But when you get to talk to them, you know, one of the things, the tactics that I like to use is like connect with them as a human, right? They are probably sitting in a desk and getting yelled at all day. So they love to hear someone who like is nice to them. And then and then ask them, ask them very specific questions after having read the source document that they're going to read. Because the likelihood is that they've got too many source documents and they never actually read the whole thing. But if you've read the thing and you have a path that you want to go down, but you're just looking for their, their confirmation that it's an okay path to do it, they can answer yes or no questions. They can't give you advice. They can't tell you how to do it. So you read the rules yourself, you come up with a game plan and you call them up and you go, I want to make mead in Southern California. It qualifies as an agricultural wine according to the code of federal regulations. So I'm going to file for a wine permit, right? And they go, yes. You know? So you, you just like boil it down to simple yes or no questions and you never get angry at them. Otherwise they just shut down and stop working. So it also, it also makes it harder once they get mad at you, they're going to hold your permit, right? They're, oh, I've heard, I've talked to this jerk and they'll pass it on. And next thing you know, it goes through the pile and then your name comes back up. Hopefully they forgot you about that time that you were a jerk on the, on the phone of the list. So yeah, always be nice to your inspectors. That's well, how we really first started out as uh, I'm a fryer. So we did a lot of uh, meads for hand fastenings, broom jumpings. We supplied the mead instead of champagne. So if you wanted to pay $5,000 for me to marry you, basically we supplied the mead to your event. And that's how I figured out about the alcohol guys coming and say, are you selling the liquor? Uh, no, we're selling the bottles. What's in it? I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, you can't, you know, you only could, you know, barefoot around some things so much. So yeah, I always try to get on the good graces of your inspector and your state commissioners about, who's taxing it even in your state because uh, Wyoming's very small. Uh, all of our alcohol is sold to the state commission and then it's sold then to retail unless you buy it directly from me. So you can buy it directly from me at my winery, but if you're going to, if you're going to sell it to retail, sell to different places, uh, you know, he's talking about how you get your meads out and stuff, go to a Celtic fest, try to go to a couple brew festivals, Try to have people taste and sample it. Uh, go to your local liquor mart and set up a booth and say, hey, would you like to sample something that's a little odd, a little different, man? And try to get your name out there just kind of locally to where you're selling it kind of uh, locally to your people here under like regulation format, of course, if you have your BPT stamp, your state authentication and stuff like that. But if you if you hit up some of these brew festivals, hit some Renaissance fairs, some Celtic festivals, uh, some farmers markets. Look underneath your cottage law. If you're licensed already and you have your stamp, you can go to the farmers market with open distributing. And I, I think it's basically you can't sell openly, but you can sell the bottles as packaged good. It depends on the state. There, so, so there's a lot of layers of um, regulation, and each one is a little different depending on what state you're in. Um, California is one of the easiest ones because we're a winery and the wine lobby in California is pretty strong. So it was able to get a lot of kind of allowances. But basically, Service Corps of Retired Executives uh, scores through the Small Business Administration is a great starting point. That, that was one of the huge starting points for us. They pointed this thing, us to this thing called CalGold, uh, calgold.ca.gov for people in California. But it's, it's a little website where you punch in what county in California you're going to get start your business and what um, kind of business it's going to be. So we punched in San Diego County and winery and it spit out all the federal, state and local regulations we needed to hit for our type of business. A lot of them weren't applicable. Like it said, you need a building permit. Well, we didn't have a building. Um, you know, we weren't going to be building anything. So we didn't need the building permit. It said we needed a CO2 permit, but we would have less than the 50 pounds of CO2 that they needed to get the permit. So there were things that didn't apply, but if you have something like that in your state, that's huge. It, it's basically a roadmap for all your regulations. And then you just like go through it and 
fill out the forms, talk to the regulators if you have questions, submit them and try to do them all in parallel. Like some people are confused. Do I need the federal one or the state one first? And actually you just file them both and the state one to conclude means your federal one needs your federal bond number. So you, when you get your federal bond number, you send it to the state office and they plug it into your application and you're both done at like the same time. So, um, so that's how I approached it. I'm happy to advise on that, but again, like time is, you know, valuable. Um, and I, I, each case is going to be a little bit different, but, um, like Michael was saying, once you get it out there and people start to drink it, it creates its own energy, you know, and, and you start to solve oh, these yeah. problems. So, Oh, totally. You're on, you're on your game right there. People taste it. Once you get a product that, that people want, it doesn't out. matter what the price is, man. They're going to come and get it. I found that out too. <laughs> All right. Next question comes from Dave and I'm going to put a little, add a little to it. Um, are you familiar with Stephen Harris's kit? He calls it jungle juice. And can his kit be made to uh, use to me to make mead? And my add on it to that is uh, what other kits are there or are there kits you would recommend? Yeah, so I've, I've never heard of that kit. Um, in the presentation, though, when I cover the basic equipment, that's generally what most kits include. Um, and you'll need the yeast nutrient, you'll need the yeast, you'll need the honey, and you'll need spring water. So uh, specific mead making kits that I can recommend, I don't have one. Uh, we don't, we're not really in that business either. I'm sure there's ones that are out there, but you know, you guys are resourceful. A carboy, a bucket, a spoon, um, an airlock, honey, water, yeast, yeast nutrient. That's enough to get started. A racking cane and a tube are, are very useful as well. Now the, the more in depth you get, the more stuff you're going to buy, you're going to get that wonder lust. If you guys have seen my presentation with Jack, you go to the local dollar store, you buy one gallon of water, you walk over to the next shelf, you buy a, a, a pound of honey, you walk across the next shelf, you get your yeast and a balloon and you're, and you're off and running, man. And you're ready to go. You're making mead. And I, you know, like I said, it just depends how depth when you get to the new nutrients, right? You've got ferment O, ferment K, yeast energizer. I mean, that depends on what type of flavors you're trying to even blend out eventually, because that even goes with the types of yeast that you use to get different flavorings. I mean, it just depends how in depth you want to get into it. But like I said, you can go to Home Depot, buy a five-gallon bucket, drill a hole in it, put a hose in it, throw it in another bucket of water, and there's your airlock. I mean, it's it's not it's not. I mean, some of my fermentations are open fermentations. Some of them are Celtic wax capping, where we melt wax, put it on the top of the the water, it floats as the wax boils up. You know, it's fermenting as the wax drops. You know, fermentation's almost over, and then you add more feed to it. The alcohol runs out because the sugar drops to the bottom, activates the yeast, the wax rises. When it falls, you add more nutrients and it flows out. I mean, it, there's, man, it depends on which area you want to go through. If you're doing Turkish tiha, right, that's tiha mead. Or if you're doing Egyptian bulk, like I said, we do most of ours from Celtic Ireland. I mean, when it comes to kits, you know, Williams Brewing, your local probably brew store. Look at right online. Just jump, jump in. I would, you know, like I said, a gallon jug from the dollar store. Throw a balloon on it, man. You'll see the balloon go. When the balloon drops, fermentation's done. I mean, that's those are some easier, cheaper ways, man. You don't, you don't have to dump a lot of money to get a good liquor. <laughs> yeah, one of my my business partners was deployed to Afghanistan, and he was getting honey from the mess hall and water and took the skin off an apple and dropped it into the honey water mix and closed it up and we'd like burp it every 12 hours uh, before <laughs> going on watch. And uh, he had me in Afghanistan. So, you know, don't, don't worry about it too much, but as you get more into it, you'll learn the techniques to make the quality better and better. And, and you'll also learn to not only make quality, you also learn how to make a good meat at a good price. Cause like I said, sometimes, for a gallon, you know, he's you're, you said you're putting one pound of honey in per gallon of water. Um, that's is that no, 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 one gallon for five gallons, so it's like three gallons of honey, um, 
or excuse me, three pounds per gallon. See, that's what we're doing is three to four pounds. And a lot of, you know, and, and you can state honey's expensive depending where you get it. So that's going to be your number one cost on any kit you buy or what you do. And it depends if you're getting honey off the store shelf or if you're getting it like Frank gets it or how I get it. You know, I'm, I'm calling a, a supplier in Honolulu, Hawaii, and I'm shipping in macadamia nut honey and I'm boiling macadamia nuts and blanching them to make a macadamia nut mead. That stuff gets expensive. You know, I, I, I've only tried, uh, what's it, Monoluca honey once from New Zealand, and that shit was $46 a pound. You know, I, it, I don't know how in-depth you want to get in that, but, you know, it's, it, I think the number one cost in any kit you're going to look for is the type of raw honey that you're going to get. All right. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Uh, next question is from Jake. Jake asks, since every crop of honey is unique and has a different taste profile, how do you approach scaling up a particular uh, individual mead drink, not a brand? Whew. Great question, Jake. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we like to think of it as like each brand of drink is a variation on a theme. So our orange blossom should have the citrus floral character that's always there. It'll vary as the crop's intensity and flavor profile varies, but it'll always be citrusy. It'll always be floral. Whereas our California oak is like a wildfire with oak and it's going to have those really uh, quintessential honey uh, characteristics up front. And then the oak will come in with some vanilla and caramel and kind of whiskey notes. And then the ale yeast will really provide this beer quality. They'll kind of shift. Um, but on the back of every bottle, it says, you know, honey, no, no hive makes the same kind of honey. It just says no batch of meat is the same. Celebrate that diversity, share that story. Um, but you gotta, you gotta tee up your customer's expectation for that as well. Yeah, you're on it. You're on it, Frank. The object is to get the, to get the both flavor. I, you got it. I, I drank your guys's mead when we were there at uh, Permaculture Voices and, uh, you, it's, uh, you're, you're absolutely correct. It's, it's about the final product. I usually don't say anything to anybody until I drink it after one year of aging, mm. right? Because then at least I know it's aged out to where it's going to be the final blend of what it's going to be before you do anything. And that was like one of my questions I was going to ask you is about back flavoring to try to get those flavors to get the residual without getting it too damn sweet, right? That's one of the things that most people like a, a drier mix or even even a sour Right, going with more of a sour mix is because sours are big right now and the micro brew. So, sours are big. So, you know, when he's talking about, yes, the different florals of honey, the concept is I'm using clover honey, I'm using orange peels and zest. I'm trying to get it to close to the same taste and the aromatic the same every time. But uh, that, that was one of my questions is like on your back flavoring, how do you keep it down on the sugar content so it's not so sweet? Yeah, I saw that as a question down the list, and I know we're four minutes from <laughs> from uh, scheduled departure time here, so I'm happy to hang on an extra 20 minutes if, if people are down. But I do got to bounce at one or at a at the 50 mark. Um, is that cool, Joe? Yeah, yeah. If you if you got the time, um, I'll I'll make sure we uh, close it up here about around the 50 mark. Cool. Yeah, and I just love to fly through these. Um, if that's cool. Yeah. Okay, so why those states, Jake asked. Um, I had a business partner on the East Coast, New York. Uh, he could sell in that in that market, so he got us contracts in New York, and then that spread into Jersey, and then Maryland and D.C. Um, so as we kind of reimagine where we're going, the tasting rooms are a bigger part of it. We can educate people in a revenue-positive way. Uh, they come into the tasting room, have a great experience, and then the demand goes to their home markets, so L.A., uh, Orange County. So that's where a lot of our growth is going to be, is the Southern California region. Uh, how do you quantify a batch of honey as to whether it measures up and what type of meat it is best for? So I kind of touched on that, but basically you're looking for floral and fruity flavor profiles. Malty and caramely work as well, but uh, if it gets into that medicinal, uh, resinous, vegetal flavor profile and you can really tell that when you like take a little bit of honey and spread it on your hand and just smell your hand does that smell good does it smell like beautiful qualities or does it smell a little funky the likelihood is if it smells funky it's going to make a funky meat 
Uh, do you require natural, no chemicals for your honey suppliers? So for our Mirth line, yes. For our big line where we're selling a 500 mil for $11.99 in the stores, um, we're using sous vide honey, which is a byproduct of monoculture pollination. And that's just kind of the world as it is. But if we're gonna change it, I think we've got to start. We gotta build the mead market. We gotta build the mead market for 20 to 30 to 40 dollar bottles of mead. And then we can start to shift the honey suppliers because we buy a lot of honey and we can have some for some pricing power, some purchasing power with those honey suppliers. Um, do you have a formula for pricing positioning in the market? Yeah. If it costs me two dollars, I want to sell it for six. If it costs me eight dollars, I want to sell it to, for twenty-four. Does that mean you know a wholesaler will buy it for six and then they'll turn around and sell it to a retailer for nine and the retailer will turn around and sell it for to the customer for twelve? Um, so basically the price on the shelf, half of that goes in your pocket and you want to make sure that those are thick enough margins to be able to run your business. You want to pay for your cost of goods, pay for your people, pay for your overhead and profit to grow off of. So that's why I multiply it by three, uh, and then distributor adds, uh, about three bucks on top of that. And then a uh, retailer adds three bucks on that. And if you do the math and get those percentages, that's how that works. Um, what do you think about Red Star yeast that Jack Spierko recommends? So Red Star makes some great stuff. Um, my experience has been that it's primary wine, primarily wine yeast and KV116 that they do, I think is, is really good um, for making some meads. And then Narbonne 71B, uh, that's like the typical mead yeast. Um, but I find it's a much sweeter and fruitier mead and I like a more dry and refreshing mead. So I stick with Safael 05. Uh, White Labs is doing some interesting stuff, but we haven't moved past the, the dating phase um, with any of those. I want to jump in here real quick. Those, all, those questions were all from Jake, just so everybody knows. Uh, if you could just, yeah, just let everybody know who's asking the question. First name. <laughs> Jake. <laughs> <laughs> so good question. So Brian Wood asked, this might have been asked, but where can we purchase Golden Coast meat? Is it available in stores like Whole Foods New Season Market? So thanks, Brian. So we're in Whole Foods, Sprouts, BevMo, Cost Plus World Market, the Marine Corps Exchange, the Navy Exchange down here in San Diego, and then a bunch of the independent bottle shops. Um, we also sell online uh, through our website, www.goldencoastmead.com. And we uh, also are in New York, New Jersey, Maryland, and DC. We're in a lot of the Whole Foods out there, not all of them, because New Jersey has some weird liquor laws. Um, but in New York and Maryland and DC, we are and then uh, a lot of the independents and a lot of the hip craft beer bars like Brooklyn and Manhattan, like our meads, which is cool. Um, Jill Bateman asked, I'm a beekeeper and have wanted to get into mead making, but I've never had a mead I liked. I make beer and hard cider. So I feel like I should love mead, but I just don't. Always too sweet for me. And I'm not a fan of white wines in general. Can you suggest a mead to change my mind? They're expensive. So I haven't tried a lot of meads. What do you consider the attributes of a great mead? Jill. This is like the fundamental question right there. And hopefully if you tried our mead, you would like it. Uh, we like to do ale yeast means. So the residual sugar is like 0.3% to zero. Usually they're dry, uh, but we want to leave a lot of the honey characteristic up front, but finish dry and refreshing. So if I were to recommend a mead to you, I would re recommend our Savage Bois. Um, it has a lot of those honey characteristics up front and then it ends with like these culinary spices and a nice refreshing finish. Uh, if you're into more tart stuff, which with the cider you might be, I would recommend our sour orange blossom. We take orange blossom honey and use a lactobacillus culture and that makes it nice and tart. But what makes a mead too sweet is too much residual sugar at the end. So managing your fermentation and letting those yeast eat pretty much all the sugar without getting into the stress place where they make bad flavors is how you're gonna have a dry, clean mead that has honey aroma and flavor up front but doesn't finish too sweet. Um, so then Jake Robinson asked, so I was in the middle of making my first batches of mead, five one gallon batches, and then my house sold and had to get out, basically just boxed up the mead that was all either done fermenting or just about done. I moved it to my new house back on April 19th. Haven't even opened the box and kind of afraid that they won't be tasty because I never racked off the primary. Can I expect bitter or awful tasting mead? Several had orange or lemon adjuncts and some had other fruit. Give it a try, man. The only way yeah. you're going to do it is by trying it. Uh, yeah, open that up and drink that. 
yeah, I'd, I'd bottle them up, you know, getting a few champagne bottles um, or, or even old beer bottles, as, as long as the residual sugar is less than one. And you can do that with a hydrometer reading. You just pour the mead into a graduated cylinder or cylinder, and then you float a hydrometer. And if it levels out at the one bricks or the 0 0.003 specific gravity point uh, or lower, then you know that your residual sugar isn't too high and you're not going to get exploding bottles. Um, as long as you use champagne bottles. If you use beer bottles, put them in the fridge. And it's five one gallon batches. So that's like um, roughly 10, not even 10, like seven and a half times five, like 35, like a case of beer in the fridge. So just put it in the fridge and you'll be good. All right, Brian Wood, for the aeration, can you use an air stone and small aquarium pump to help the yeast really kick off or is that overkill? Some people are doing that. And uh, in the wine world, they're actually showing that like barrel fermentation takes up oxygen through the wood in microscopic levels or, you know, really micro levels. So you may be way more complex than we give them credit for. If you want to nerd out like that, Jake, you do it. Or is that Jake? Uh, no, it was someone else. Uh, you do that. But I would say drilling and blending to aerate for the first three days is good enough. Uh, and then if you want to take it to the next level, maybe you're selling $150 bottles of meat every time. Yeah. Shaking it like Michael's saying. All right, what would be a ballpark MVP startup cost to open a meadery? So, I mean, that. do you want to make one batch a year? If so, that's like six grand for the tank, one grand for the chiller, um, and then the rest of the equipment might be another couple grand. So you could, and then you got to get the license, which is another two or three grand. So like 14 grand would be enough to do like, a thousand liters a year. Um, well, you need some working capital for your uh, honey. And Two thousand bucks. So maybe fifteen. What do you think? Twenty-two thousand dollars. Is that yeah? Is that what you're going with? Yeah, twenty-two thousand dollars, and that's to do at least uh, three batches in a, in a year's time period. What right. size batches? What's that? What size batches? Uh, they're going to be two hundred fifty gallon batches. Cool. Cool. All right, yeah. I mean, that's like 10 to 20K is reasonable. Um, but it depends on how many batches and, you know, how involved you want to get. What makes some commercial meads sickeningly sweet? So that's, there's a lot of commercial meads that kind of have, have gotten started. And, you know, the nutrient addition piece is really cutting edge. So they may not have integrated it into their model. And so they found folks that like sweet, sweet stuff and they... Uh, and they found a product and found a market and they just went for it. So we approached it a different way. Um, and, and it's like champagne and port are wine, but they're totally different, right? Port is in my mind for a cold evening around fire and philosophizing and champagne is for dancing and celebrating, you know, and port is for dancing and celebrating too. If, you know, it's a different group. So there's, there's a huge spectrum here and like, there's a lot of words that include like some kind of value judgment when you talk about these different crafts, but the reality is like, we're all trying to make the best thing that we can. And I think that some meads are sweet because people haven't understand, understood the yeast health and the ability to ferment out all the residual sugar. They haven't understood the uh, side effects of stressing the yeast out and making the yeast kind of off flavored. So they've back sweetened, to kind of cover that up. And then they add a lot of sulfites and sorbates to stabilize it. And that's like really an art form that needs to be approached really subtly and really beautifully. And so we kind of avoid it because we can't really do it well. Like I'm, I'm way more stoked on a mead that starts as honey and water and gets fermented and ends up dry and honey forward, but balanced and doesn't need any of the stabilizers or preservatives to make it work. So that's our approach. But different people are like superstition out of Arizona is doing some amazing sweet dessert meads. And uh, it's just up to personal preference and technical ability. Personal preference. Yeah. So, uh, and that's cool because that makes the whole mead market way bigger. And people have mead parties and they bring over 10 bottles of mead to a party and like, oh, taste this one, taste this one. And they're all totally different. And there's a rad time because people are like, this one's awesome. This one's awesome. So, uh, another way to monetize is to sell a mead kit. Uh, st similar to Steve Harris. Um, some folks have done that. No guy in Australia who kind of has a little startup doing that. I think that, you know, if you've got an online store and you have the bandwidth to do that, why not? 
Um, Kate Potter, how hard is it to get licensed to sell mead to have a tasting room? So in California, it's relatively easy. It totally depends on your state. What is the process to get a winery going with a tasting room in your state? But generally, there's like a winemakers association that you can join or at least ask questions of. And they'll, or the state universities will sometimes have a like how to start a winery um, PowerPoint or, or expert uh, in the extension office. And then you might want to reach out to them. All right, Bruce Winsitz. I live in Northern Indiana, surrounded by core soy fields. Don't we all, corn soy fields, don't we all. Wouldn't raising bees here simply be drawing them to their deaths from poisoning by ag chemicals? What do you think, Michael? Say that again? Yeah, I live in Northern Indiana, surrounded by corn soy fields. Wouldn't raising bees here simply be drawing them to their deaths from poisoning by ag chemicals? Uh, most of your corn and stuff like that is pollinated by wind. It doesn't officiate usually with bees unless you're processing the corn already down, soybeans and stuff. Um, you have to really watch what you're doing with the, with the bees when it comes to those fields. Finding good raw honey and getting the pollen count is number one in mead making in, 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 my, in my theory. Like I said, you can go to any shelf and buy Sue Bee honey. You can buy anything that's local that's been heat pasteurized to that they throw on the shelf. If you're looking to keep your bees, you always should join your uh, Department of Agriculture. Uh, we did a thing with Permaethos that told you that if you go and uh, register your bees with the department, they'll tell you actually what fields are getting sprayed at what time, which farmlands are GMO, which ones are organic. And, you know, it's, as it's getting further and further in the process of farms listing, where they're getting their product, what they're spraying on their fields, you're going to do a lot better. Are you putting your bees to death? If you don't know what you're doing, you're going to put your bees to death no matter what. It takes somebody that is, that's going to be aggressive as a beekeeper, right? It's one thing to be a hobby beekeeper and have five beehives in your backyard, pollinating your local garden, getting stuff from the botanical gardens down the road or what the city's planting along the roadsides. But for a guy that's going to have over 25 to 50 beehives, you know, he's looking at an average of 20 minutes per beehive at a minimum to inspect them. And if you've got that kind of investment of about $400 a hive, you don't want to lose them. So you're going to be very active in those beehives every nine to 11 days. It's an investment. So if you're going to put them out in those types of fields, hoping for a reward, you better be active with your department of agriculture and those farmers to see what they do, or you're going to lose them, man. That's, that's basic concepts of beekeeping. That's great. Thanks. All right. Next question is from Daniel. What site gave you the regulations? Yeah. So in California, it's called calgold.ca.gov. Awesome. So they, you just there's need to find out where your local state one is. And there's also the Small Business Administration and Service Corps of Retired Executives. And they exist to give small advice to business or businesses. They exist to give advice to small businesses. So. All right. Look Last for B, look oh. for your BBT stamp. Just get on your federal government site, type in alcohol. They're going to give you your location for your BBT stamp location. And then you got to contact your local state agency that controls your alcohol distribution. And like I said, he said, every state's different, but the one is the feds want their money first. So they're the ones that are going to want their tax money first. So you need your tax stamp for your feds. Then it's approved, like you said, by your state. And like our state in Wyoming, they knock on 15, 17%. So whatever I'm going to sell it to, I sell it to the state. They knock on 17% onto it. Then the feds knock their money onto it. And then it's the retailers of what they want to market up to for sale. Awesome. All right. Last question, guys, is from Brian. He asks, for Michael or Frank, what size bottles are you using for going to market? Wine bottle size or maybe smaller like the uh, kombucha bottles that are 12 ounce. Yeah, so there's some regulations that govern this choice. If you're doing alcohol over 6.9%, then you got to do it in a standard size, a standard wine size, which is either 375, 500, 750, or one and a half liter, or 1.8 or 0.187 liter. So there's there's standards if you're over 7% alcohol that you have to do. Um, if you're under 7%, you can put it in whatever kind of bottle. Um, 
So it depends on what kind of mead you want to make and then what kind of market you're going to market you're going to go after. If you're going to go after the champagne drinking market, then put it in a champagne bottle and they're going to be like, oh, I drink champagne. And you're like, this is better than champagne. Um, if you're going after the beer drinking market, then you're probably going to want to get one of those 6% recipes going um, and put it in a package that a beer drinker is going to gravitate towards. Because, you know, people are trained to go after what they're used to. And the more you can capitalize off that training to get them to make those choices that favor your products easier, uh, the more success you're going to have with less expenditure of energy. All right. Now, that's, that's, that's the basic reply that I give is that you have to go by the standard of bulk of alcohol. If we have a really high concentrate, because we do a de-icing. We throw a meat in an icing formulation and scrape water off, bringing the alcohol content some up to 26%. So we do a, a non-distilling. Let me put that out there because we're not distilling it. We're using Nordic icing methods, and it brings the alcohol content. But that's also with flavoring and stuff. We go with the 350, I think is what they are, or three, 300 milliliter bottles. Yeah, they're the smaller bottles. Uh, that, that's because of the alcohol content according to volume. Now, if we're just bringing out a regular mead, like a, a Concord grape mix, a, a, a Vikings blood mix, uh, something like that, we're going with the 700, I think it's 750 milliliter, right? It's just the basic bottle size. You know, and those, those are mostly selling when you get those and you're bottling up that size, that's a basic bottle. They sell anywhere from $15 to $24. And then it just depends on how in depth you want to get like on your honey. We bring in periwinkle honey from Ireland. There's only two crops I know of. We're able to get at least one batch and we only, we're only getting, I think it's like 120 pounds because of shipping costs for it. So when you're bringing in stuff like that, of course the bottles that are 750 milliliter are going to be about 60 to 80 bucks a bottle because of just the price for that. Like I said, the number one price is the honey. All right. Well, thank you both for very, very much for being with us today. Thank you, especially Frank. Michael, we will, uh, we got to organize a presentation with you. Michael does <laughs> our, uh, Mike, Mike does our uh, beekeeping course on Permethos if you're interested in getting into beekeeping. And, uh, but thank you very much for your time, Mike. Thanks for staying a little later and answering, getting all those questions answered. Great job. Um, very excited to have you. Yeah. Great to see you, Frank, man. Super good time and your product uh, when I was at uh, Permaculture Voices, man. Good good seeing you. Thanks, man. Love to see you at Mazer Cup this year. Oh, we might have to go to a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, later. guys. Well, for more, you can head over to permaethos.com. Uh, follow us on Facebook and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Once again, thank you to our panelists today for joining us uh, with a great conversation. Thank you to all of you for all of your great questions. Uh, we love the audience participation, and we hope to see you in the next episode of PETV Presentations. Have a great night.